Hi everyone, uh, I need to start with an apology today because as you can see, we're not out in the mountains. Uh, I've got a bit home for the delivery of a lawnmower. Jackpot. Not very exciting that is it. Hopefully what is more exciting is the topic of today's video, which is the practical difference in the real world between a small sensor, uh, in this case my G9, my trusty G9, uh, and a bigger sensor, which is my uh, Lumix S5 full frame camera that I've had for about six months. Now I don't want this video to be specifically about these two cameras because I don't think that would be of interest to all that many people. What I do want it to be about though is uh, small and big sensors generally and some of the considerations you need to factor in when you're working out which camera and which system might be right for you. Uh, because there are differences, there are performance advantages with a big camera or a big sensor and uh, sometimes, and I'll go through them in this video, there are examples where the difference between the two, certainly in terms of things like image quality, is negligible. Uh, and there are other times where there are differences. So, without further ado, let me go through some of those differences. Before I do though, actually, so with further ado, um, this G9 is a micro four third sensor. If you've not got any interest in the uh, intricacies of Micro Four Thirds, then you might want to skip to the next point. But there are some considerations to bear in mind specifically for Micro Four Thirds. Most notably, the sensor shape is different. The name is a giveaway. It's a four by three sensor as opposed to a full frame setup, which is a three by two sensor, which basically means you have a different shape in front of you whenever you're taking a picture. Now, there are some slight resolution differences between these two specific cameras. This S5 has 24 megapixels, which to be honest, resolution wise is the low end for uh, full frame cameras now. I mean, this is a hybrid camera, meaning that lots of people will buy it for its video capabilities as well as its photo capabilities. But typically, if you're looking at a, a photography uh, full frame camera, a photography specific full frame camera, then 24 megapixels in 2021 is very much the low end. But this has got 24, this has got 20, and the difference between the two is pretty slight anyway. I mean, four megapixels is not very much. However, if you, like me, prefer shooting kind of squarer aspect ratios, like four by three, or even square, if you like to upload square photos to Instagram, for example, then you'll find that the resolution difference between these two becomes even more negligible because most of the extra pixels on a three by two sensor, or certainly in this case, come at the edge of the four by three frame to give you the three by two aspect ratio. I don't know if I've made any sense there, but uh, fingers crossed I have. Now clearly that wouldn't be the case if I was using a 50 megapixel full frame camera. Uh, there would still be loads more resolution in the 50 megapixel file, regardless of what aspect ratio you're using compared to a 20 megapixel file. However, if we were using a 50 megapixel full frame camera, you might not see some of the noise benefits over the Micro Four Thirds camera that I'm about to show you, because in that case, the pixel densities would be much closer than they are in this example. Also another implication of Micro Four Thirds, just before I show you those examples, uh, because there is a different aspect ratio, I think, and I stand to be corrected on this by a Lumix engineer or somebody who, who works on cameras and knows more about cameras than me, but I think there are probably metering differences between a 4x3 sensor and a 3x2 sensor just because they see different scenes at the same focal length. So for example, when I'm shooting with my G9, uh, let's say for the sake of argument, 50 mil full frame equivalent, I will see more of the sky uh, and potentially more of the valley floor and the darker tones that might be associated with that uh, when I'm shooting in landscape orientation on my Micro Four Thirds camera, just because the image is naturally taller as a four by three aspect ratio. Similarly, when I'm shooting portrait orientation on a full frame camera, because the image is three by two in aspect ratio, it's much taller than a portrait photo uh, on a Micro Four Thirds camera. And that means that out in nature, out in the mountains again, I might get more sky and more of some of the darker tones uh, at the bottom of the image at the valley floor, for instance. And in practical terms, I find in my experience, what that means is that you need to be very careful about your exposure when you're using a Micro Four Thirds camera or a Four Thirds uh, aspect ratio when you're out in nature shooting at landscape orientation. And you need to be just as careful when you're shooting a three by two sensor in portrait orientation. Uh, anyway, hopefully I'm making sense so far. Let's look at some images, shall we? Uh, right, so here is a first shot of, um, well, it's quite boring to be honest. It's just some farmland in quite harsh light, but I think it does quite a good job of showing what each camera does uh, at base ISO, which is uh, 100 ISO for the S5 and 200 ISO for the G9. 
And personally, I can't really see a difference in noise. There is a slight difference in resolution. Uh, the S5 file 100% is slightly bigger. But in terms of noise, I don't think there's much in it. Now, there will be a difference in terms of noise at all ISOs with these cameras, but it's about whether or not you can see it. And certainly at base ISO, 200 and 100, I can't really see a difference. Now, here is a shot that I got uh, a few mornings ago when I was shooting the last video, which is at 800 ISO, ISO 800 on both cameras. And now I can start to see a difference. So on the S5, the image still looks super nice and clean. On the G9, we are starting to get quite a bit of noise. And if we head to this image, which I shot at ISO 1600 on both cameras, you can see that there really is quite a bit of noise now on the G9. And the S5 file still looks pretty clean to my eye, and it's even more noticeable. I mean, I don't know if you can tell at all, to be honest, thanks to YouTube compression, but it is really, really noticeable if I'm to lift up these shadows, and particularly on the G9 image, super noisy now. Now, I have spoken quite a bit in the past about how I don't really mind noise. I think if your photo is good enough, it doesn't particularly matter if it's noisy, people are still gonna find it engaging. However, it's interesting to see that there is clearly quite a big difference between these two cameras at the same ISOs. However, there is a big elephant in the room and that elephant is called equivalence. Bit of a strange name for an elephant, I know, but uh, let me explain. So, so far, each of the images that I've shown you haven't actually been equivalent images because the Micro Four Thirds files have had twice the depth of field of the, uh, the full frame S5 files. Uh, and that's because any camera or any system that has a smaller sensor than a full frame camera has a crop factor. And in the case of Micro Four Thirds, that crop factor is times two, which essentially means that if I'm shooting at 25 mil on uh, a Micro Four Thirds camera, then to get an equivalent field of view on a full frame camera, I'll need to shoot at 50 mil. It also means that if I'm shooting at F8 on my full frame camera, then to get the same depth of field on my Micro Four Thirds camera, I'll only have to shoot at F4, because depth of field is determined by the size of the aperture, not the F number, and naturally, on a smaller system, you're gonna be dealing with smaller apertures. So, this has some quite interesting implications for uh, particularly low light photography, I think. And if we look at this photo, I can run through my settings for it. Uh, I shot it on the S5, and I used an aperture of f5.6 to make sure that the majority of stuff in the frame was in focus. In fact, at this focal length, I think probably everything is in focus. Um, and I wanted to hand hold the camera for the shot, which meant that I wanted to make sure my shutter speed was no less than a tenth of a second. And to do that, I needed an ISO of 3200. Now, as I said, all the other images that I've shown you so far, I've used exactly the same settings on both cameras. But actually, if I want the same photographic result as this using my Micro Four Thirds camera, then I could use F2.8 to get the same depth of field. And because I'm using F2.8, I can take my ISO down to 800. And when I do that, that gives me the same shutter speed. It also gives me very, very, very similar noise performance. Now clearly the exact results of this are gonna be dependent on individual sensor comparisons. Not all sensors are the same, just because they sit in the same systems, they've all got different talents and abilities. But in this example, doing this, the results are very similar. Now of course, if you're willing to forego some of the depth of field in a scene, then you can take your full frame camera down to f2.8, and then you can take your ISO down to 800 to match the ISO of the Micro Four Thirds camera, and you'll then get much cleaner results from the full frame camera. Yeah, and of course what you could then do is switch your zoom lens on your Micro Four Thirds camera for a fast prime, go down to 1.4, and then you'll get the same results by switching to ISO 200 on your Micro Four Thirds camera. But then you could just get a prime for your full frame camera, sacrifice some more depth of field, and get a much cleaner image by going to uh, ISO 200 on your full frame camera kind of a race to the bottom. And ultimately, if you're willing to sacrifice depth of field and having everything in your scene in focus, then uh, chances are you're always gonna get a cleaner image on a full frame camera. And of course you might be thinking, well, that doesn't matter to me. I, I don't like shooting handheld. I use a tripod, so I don't need to have as much control over my shutter speed. But there are plenty of examples in low light where you do need control of your shutter speed, whether it's wind moving grass in your frame, uh, there might be cars moving through your frame. You might have stars in your frame and you want to control the shutter speed so that they don't move too much in the frame. 
Loads of examples. And as I say, if it's the case that you don't mind sacrificing some depth of field or you don't mind focus stacking, then uh, the bigger the sensor, the more advantage you've got over a smaller sensor. Uh, and in a nutshell, that is why I decided to get myself an S5 to complement my G9, which I'm still gonna be using an awful lot when the light is good and when I can shoot at base ISOs. So yeah, just as good images in the day, but definitely cleaner images at night. And uh, even though I do prefer shooting four by three, um, I do find that three by two is in a lot of cases more useful as an output aspect ratio of things like prints and books and stuff. So that is the other advantage I find with shooting full frame over micro four thirds, even if I prefer the, uh, the look of four by three. Now, as I've spoken about a million times on this channel, there are some costs associated with carrying around a full frame camera. And uh, namely, those costs are typically to do with weight. So this S5 and my 24 to 70 2.8 Sigma lens weighs in at uh, 1570 grams. This G9 with my trusty 12 to 35 weighs in at 964. So what's that? That's like a, a 35, 40% difference just between two cameras and two lenses. And actually that difference is just in the lenses because the cameras themselves actually weigh the same. The thing is there is also a difference between the lens I'm shooting this on, which is the eight to 18 uh, fantastic micro four thirds lens and this 16 to 35, kind of an equivalent lens for my S5. So this is 537 grams and that I think is 350 grams or so. But the biggest difference is between this and this, so this is my telephoto lens for uh, my G9. It's a 35 to 100 f 2.8, which gives you the same focal lengths as a 70 to 200 on a full frame camera. This weighs 416 grams. This, the F4 version, not even the F2.8 version, because I'm not really gonna be using this much in low light. Uh, this is 1325 grams. So all up, my micro four third system is about half the weight of this full frame setup. And so over the three and a half years that I've been using my G9 religiously, people have been saying, why don't you use a full frame camera? The cameras weigh the same. They do, but the lenses, the lenses are a whole different kettle of fish. So I still fully intend to be using my G9 an awful lot because it is so much lighter and uh, I'll be taking it out into the mountains and on long bike rides and stuff, particularly when I know that I'm gonna be home before the sun goes down. Because as I say, at base ISOs, I really can't see a whole lot of difference between this and this, which wouldn't necessarily be the case if I was using a full frame camera, which had much higher resolutions, but I don't particularly need to at this point. And if I was doing that, then I'd probably end up giving up some of the gains in low light that this offers over this. I don't know if I've been clear at all, but hopefully that helps for some of you that have had the questions on um, the differences between these two cameras. Anyway, thank you for watching. Hopefully that was useful. And also a big thank you to this week's video sponsor, Skillshare. So Skillshare is an amazing online learning platform with thousands of classes in all kinds of different creative pursuits. And I'm currently taking a class on branding for entrepreneurs, which is very interesting. I probably should have thought about branding a long time before I actually have started thinking about branding, but never mind. I'm doing it now, so that's that's what matters. But there are all kinds of different things on there from photography, UX design, marketing, productivity, how to organize the plants in your house, loads of stuff. And if you click the link in my description, then the first thousand of you to do so will get access to a free trial to Skillshare. And after that, if you carry on your membership, you'll pay less than $10 a month to keep access to all those thousands of classes. So a big thank you to Skillshare for their continued support and a big thank you to you for watching. Fingers crossed this lawnmower turns up, otherwise I'll, I'll be cross that I, I couldn't do this video outdoors. This table does look high, doesn't it? It should be, is that better? It's too late now, I've done it.